So I really enjoyed having the opportunity to read Professor Meyerson's paper. Um, there's two things that I liked about it. Um, the first was the way it comes full circle with the developments of insights that led to modern economics in the first place. At least if you start with the narrative by Albert Hirschman that he gives us in The Passions and the Interests, the idea of restraining bad behavior not by appeal to virtue but rather by some form of appeal to self-interest first emerged as a question of how to avoid bad government. It's good to see economists coming back to a more full-blooded, <coughs> excuse me, for more full-blooded political economy um, context for thinking about these issues. The second thing I appreciated is that his results have a certain consonance with the Catholic social thought principle of subsidiarity. Um, the emphasis on the role of local government and the way it, it provides ballast um, with respect to the national government. I think offers a fruitful chance to talk, um, to interact across the two disciplines between economics and Catholic social thought. What I want to do today is talk about um, what subsidiarity means in the terms of Catholic social thought so that we can have this conversation more fruitfully. Um, so now there's, there's many ways that you could take, take the concept of Catholic, <coughs> the Catholic social thought of subsidiarity. Um, I see it as emerging from a tradition that sees moral life as ordered to the fulfillment of human potential. Humans only reach that potential by directing themselves. At the same time, humans are essentially social and thus can only fulfill their potential in community. Thus, many of our affairs are properly directed by us as individuals or in families, while some of our affairs are properly directed at the communal level. Moreover, because of human complexity, it's not enough to think about individuals to the one side and the collective to the other. Rather, it is worth noting that we are embedded in society through a complex web of interlocking and or concentric circles. We have one type of relationship with our families, another type with social groups or organizations, another with local government, and so on. Um, <clears throat> A key theme is that human affairs should be managed at the lowest level of organization possible. So the idea that we want to build up local government fits in with that quite nicely. Okay. We can see an example of how this works in de Tocqueville, who seems to be coming in for discussion a couple times today. Um, in de Tocqueville, uh, he really stresses the development, the importance of local government, but not as a way of trying to do the sort of competitive balance that uh, Dr. Meyerson was talking about, um, but rather as a way of giving individuals an opportunity to, to arrive at their full expression of their human beings. Um, for him, the accent isn't on the effectiveness of having strong local government, but rather on the role it plays in human development. Um, it is through the intermediary levels of um, organization um, that individuals have a chance to participate as social animals, so that's their, their vehicle for arriving at their full potentials. Um, if these intermediary levels of organization fall away, too many people are deprived of the chance to exercise self-direction in social contexts. So one problem with centralization is that it leaves the individual too naked with respect to the state and without the opportunity to be a full political animal. Um, behind this view is a view as ancient, ancient as Aristotle that humans really are essentially political animals and our full realization of our potential requires both direction of ourselves and participation in the governance structures we develop in society. Okay. Um, the problem with this ancient idea of humans as political animals and the concomitant analysis about what arrangements best allow our, <clears throat> us to perfect our powers, that is to become fully virtuous or excellent as human beings, is that it seems to ignore the fact that most humans do not, in fact, direct their lives according to the question of what will lead them to the highest level of virtue or excellence or perfection. But rather, most humans seem to operate out of more mundane concerns about status or wealth. The great insight of liberalism is that as a practical matter, you don't get to good behavior by appealing to virtue, um, nor do you get to good governance by appealing to the duty of politicians to exercise statesmen. And that's where the economist analysis comes in, by talking about the role of incentives in shaping human behavior. But as Aristotle himself, or at least through St. Thomas Aquinas, who's the, work, um, the, the thinker that I work through most, um, there's a recognition that humans do not make choices simply on the basis of the exercise of reason. Um, um, based, they don't make choices simply based on the pursuit of the true, the good, or the beautiful. Um, they also make decisions based on what economists would call incentives. So if you look at this particular framework, you have a language that will allow us to accommodate both, both themes, and that's what I see as potentially fruitful. For Aquinas, this is how it works. Human decision-making has a twofold nature. 
On the one hand, as rational creatures, we have the power to deliberate on the good and act accordingly. And this is indeed the essence of our freedom. If I'm very hungry and I'm presented with a juicy steak, I have the freedom to see the steak as a means to satisfy my hunger, or to see that it would be better to refuse the steak as an exercise of the virtue of temperance, or to refuse the steak out of some religious observance, or out of solidarity with people who are deprived of steaks, or any, <coughs> any a, a number of other considerations I might bring to bear. This ability on how to see that stake and act accordingly is peculiarly human and is the essence of human freedom. On the other hand, we can exercise reason in the way that we share with animals, and Aquinas will say that animals have their own kind of reason. Um, and we can do that by figuring out the best way of achieving a given objective or set of preferences. If my dog is hungry and she sees a steak, she's going to eat the steak. Um, I can only, and I'm not going to be able to change her behavior by having a discussion about the justice of her eating the steak that I had intended for my dinner. Um, I can only change her behavior by changing her incentives, uh, perhaps by giving her a lot of negative conditioning about scolding and spanking that might follow if she in fact eats my steak. Okay. Now, the two sides of reason should not be seen as being at war. From an Aristotelian perspective, the human project is to use our higher reason, that discernment of what really is a good object to pursue, um, <clears throat> to use that higher reason to determine that, and then train up our basic raw desires to come into alignment with those discernments. The ideal Aristotelian eats the steak when it is appropriate, uh, but is not tempted by the steak when it is not appropriate. However, Aristotle also gives us an account for most of us who can maybe see that we should not be driven by our raw passions, yummy steak, I want to eat it, um, but who struggle between the pull of those passions and the discernments of our higher reason. Um, you can tell by looking at me that I frequently succumb to the power of my passions with respect to the steak, um, but I don't, I don't have to. And anyway, he has a, has a nice language about that, that pull between what I discern is good and what I want. Okay. <clears throat> On this view, because we have this two-tier two form of reason, it would be a mistake, a, a really large error, to try to analyze or explain humans by ignoring the lower order of reason or the power of the passions in our decision making. Economists are right to emphasize that much of what we do, and indeed often should do, can be explained by incentives and the role they play. But also on this view, it would be a mistake to assume that humans are only driven by the lower form of reason. We often respond to incentives, often it is good that we respond to incentives, but humans need not be driven by them, and it's a mistake to construct society on the assumption that this is all that is at stake. Remember, to become fully human not only means exercising the higher order sort of reason, it also means exercising that reason in our common project of self-governance. Okay. We could argue that there is an appropriate division of labor to be found here. Economists can give us models of what happens if humans only exercise the lower form of reason. They can take those preferences as given and then talk about how to efficiently achieve those preferences. Um, and it's an important function. Even on Aristotle's account, most human beings primarily operate from that form of reason. And even among those who are actively engaged in the higher project of cultivating virtue, pursuing the good and the true and the beautiful, even those very often struggle with their temptations and often will act in accordance with their incentives. So you need economists to give us a good understanding of what most humans actually do. Moreover, if you are in the business of designing institutions or policy, it would almost certainly be prudent for even the most virtuous statesmen to take this into account. Um, thus, for example, for Aquinas, when he talks about natural law, which is one way he approaches the idea about what is good, um, he has a long discussion about the function of human law in that context, and his discussion of the human law t has a very large respect for the fact that most people are not virtuous, and you have to create the law in a way that's appropriate for that. Um, so if we, we could leave that analysis of, of humans as incentive-following um, creatures to the economists, and then we could leave the task of discerning what is actually good that for humans to pursue through natural law, through considerations of virtue, we could leave that to the philosophers or the theologians. Okay. But really, I'm not sure that the two can be neatly separated like that. Um, and while some division of labor is certainly a good idea, it would be better to exercise that division with a deeper respect for the tensions involved in navigating between the higher and lower forms of reason. To put the matter clearly, it's prudent to pragmatically recognize that incentives matter in determining much of human behavior, but it's also prudent to remember that humans have higher aspirations which they can and sometimes do act on. 
Um, and my, my, I've left economics as I quit my job as an economist over 10 years ago. Um, and my understanding is that economists have, in fact, really increased their appreciation for the way these higher norms can shape in human behavior. And I think we got some good citations of that from Jesus this morning. Um, so I actually think that there's good prospect for thinking of the two sides to come together here. With respect to um, Professor Meyerson's paper, I just want to use all of this machinery to make the following points. There is no doubt that it would be good to work towards institutions which are incentive compatible with good governance. Um, I really like the whole approach that he takes to the question. Even on Aristotle's account, you need to lead people to virtue, and you often have to work through incentives to get them there. Uh, it would take too long to elaborate on Aristotle's account of how we learn to be good, but incentives play a role in any account that you want to have. Um, and it would be a mistake to try to expect people to somehow just magically fly to virtuous behavior, having to work against all their incentives. Um, but it is worth asking whether you don't make the problem of achieving good governance more challenging if you set up a language that implies that incentives are all that matters. And this, I think, is the temptation that economists flirt with. Um, in Meyerson's paper, uh, we need to have constitutional changes, but as he himself acknowledges, that constitution isn't just a matter of what's written down on paper. There needs to be a living constitution, and importantly, a living set of expectations in order for these things to be binding. And those expectations are going to be these norms or higher goods that we identify through the higher form of exercise of our reason. <clears throat> Can we really get to the potential goods of decentralized democracy if the general populace believes that politicians will always and everywhere only act according to their incentives? If a good politician is the one who gets reelected by keeping his promises to a broad base of support, and a bad politician is one who stays in power by keeping his promises to a narrow base of support, we might get <coughs> better results from Meyerson's suggestions, that is, trying to set up the incentives to encourage the former over against the latter. But I'm not sure why ascending politicians, the ones working their way up their ladder, of their career ladders, wouldn't hit greater temptations to shift their allegiance to, to more narrow interests, especially as they accumulate greater, the greater power that comes with a sense of office that could be then used to suppress the many. And I'm not sure why the many would ever have faith that a politician who was understood to be only interested in incentives wouldn't be subject to such temptations. It seems to me that the ideals of decentralized democracy require some common idea that not only do politicians respond to incentives, but also the idea that they should be directly interested in good governance. We need to be able to articulate that there is a moral failure when a politician uses the powers of his office to serve the needs of the few at the expense of the good of the many. It seems to me that if you look at the course of human history, tyranny is the rule and enlightened government is more of an exception. And I am thus skeptical that any scheme for rigging incentives just so would be sufficient to produce good results. It seems to me that the ideal is rigging the incentives, but also appealing to the higher order of reason about what is true statesmanship, what is just and good and true. Now, I think working out the interactions of how these two levels of reason interact is a complex but important task. And I think economists have done already a great service by creating a science of understanding the power of incentives. But their task won't be done until they've thought harder about how to coordinate that understanding with an understanding that humans can and do operate according to higher principles. To put the point another way, you shouldn't understand the role of ideas, ideals in shaping human behavior. <clears throat> Economists are participants in a cultural conversation about what those ideals are. And to the extent that they succeed in persuading many, especially their students, that humans just are motivated by incentives, Economists erode the cultural capital that undergirds the market and political institutions they advocate. Meyerson, Dr. Meyerson's suggestions would be worth pursuing, um, but my claim today is that the institutions he describes would be more likely to deliver the good results he hopes for if they are implemented in societies that maintain a belief that human behavior is shaped not just by incentives, but by principle as well. The incentive scheme Dr. Meyerson describes has a happy resonance with the Catholic social principle of subsidiarity. It would be a tremendous, tremendous project to think hard about how to integrate the two sets of insights. Uh, it's a trade from which I think both sides would greatly benefit. Thank you. <laughs>